Time is a really cruel thing. I mean, one, we all get old and nobody wants that. But also, two, your brains start to forget. That doesn't seem very fair at all. Therefore, let us bring some wrestling individuals back into the fold so I, Simon Miller, can remind you why they were damn influential when it comes to this business. Let's go. Number 10, Taz. I want to give Taz a couple of nods here because when it comes to his commentary work, this guy does not get enough plaudits. And again, talking about being influential, he has shown everybody, if you want to go from wrestler to announcer guy, you absolutely can. I mean, he's so damn good at it. When we do go back into his wrestling days too, though, what a flubbing transformation. Because originally he was sort of a cartoon character, hence the name. When him and Paul Heyman sat down and decided, well, actually, have you seen this MMA stuff? Maybe we can merge those two disciplines. And all of a sudden, Taz became an absolute badass. This was long before USA had become a household brand either. And if you were watching Extreme Championship Wrestling, when he came out, even though he wasn't WWE size, when it came to a sports entertainer, everybody totally believed, well, you don't want to fight him, he's definitely going to win. Taz was also tapping people out, which again, nobody was doing. So when you take all of these little things and you put them into a box, you've got to give Taz a massive round of applause. Once again, this is someone that we just do not talk about enough, so I'm glad that we could change that today. Number nine, Colt Cabana. Right, just forget all the brawl out stuff for a minute. I mean, only those involved know the true deal. Let's just let it rest for a while. Because when it does come to indie wrestling and using that as your own personal business, there may be nobody in the history of this world that proved to everyone what you can do more than Colt Cabana. But if you are annoyed at all the wrestling podcasts these days, I suppose you can point the finger of blame at him. But what he was doing was so ahead of its time. And honestly, he has hundreds of episodes and every single one is damn listenable. He also gave you a tremendous look behind the scenes as he had fascinating chats with other wrestlers. But also he used it to promote his merchandise and to promote his indie bookings. So all of a sudden he was like a one man band. He was incredibly successful. He's also one of the first guys that was walking around going, oh, by the way, look, you don't need to join WWE to make this into something you can do forever. And that's why the likes of Kevin Owens and the Young Bucks all say, without Colt, I probably would have given this up a long time ago. He still continues to do this today and he's made quite a career for himself. So yeah, forget about all the other crazy stuff put more respect on his name. Number eight, Sami Zayn. If Colt Cabana was the blueprint about how to market yourself as an indie pro wrestler, then Sami Zayn was the king of the merchandise. Matthew and Nicholas Jackson have also spoken about this and said they just learned loads from this guy because when he was El Generico, Sammy would go out to the merchandise table, be it before a show, in the middle of a show or after a show, in his entire gear and basically tell the fans, hey man, you should buy one of my shirts. And this way, he was making even more cash he didn't have to share it with the promoter. This news spread throughout the industry, and it's a huge reason why we do have pro wrestling tees today. Because seriously, Zayn basically wrote the rule book. Because as crazy as it may sound, there was a period where this wasn't really happening as much. But El Generico got it until he had to go save those orphans. Whatever he did, boy do I miss him. Number seven, Mikey Whipwreck. If you are a fan of a certain age... You know one Mikey Whipwreck. The underdog of ECW, Paul Heyman totally understood how to use him. And he basically turned him into a cult hero. And the real genius is that he was a non-hardcore guy in a hardcore environment who got his ass beat all the time. But rather than the ECW fan base turning on him, they just had so much sympathy for him instead. To the point, they were desperate for Whipwreck to win. So when he finally became a champion, oh, I tell you, the place became unglued. So of course, how many times have we seen that story play out in the modern day? But there's also more here as well. Because one day, Mikey Whipwreck decided, well, I'm going to be a trainer as well. And he trained everyone. I mean, there's Matt Cardona, Brian Myers, Jay Lethal, Tony Nese, John Silver, and a bunch of others. And also, Brian Myers used this to open his own creator pro school. So when it comes to the New York scene, Whipwreck is plugged right in the middle. It just goes to show that he really did leave his mark, even though he never really did anything in WWE. And there's that sentence again. Don't forget it. Number six, Jerry Lynn. Jerry Lynn was ahead of his time. And if he had been born 10 years later, everybody would be ranting and raving about him so much more. Because honestly, whatever 2024 wrestling has become, it ain't going down without one Mr. Lynn. Now, of course, there are the likes of Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, and Shawn Waltman. But I kind of feel like we do sing their praises a lot. That's why I want to talk about the J-Man today. And it ties back into the intro. Don't forget that he was also operating at a time where you were meant to be a monster to be a pro wrestler. He had this match in the GWF in 1991 against Waltman. And 
I tell you, it was like looking into the future. How are they moving so fast? The real joy, of course, is if you go to ECW and watch his series with Rob Van Dam. Because <laughs> there are still people today that must be watching this and going, well, why don't we just do what they did? What will really get you is that you can watch this right now and it will still be like you're watching something from 2024 even though it was 30 damn years ago. Thankfully, nowadays, people will shout about Jerry Lynn Moore, and that is not an accident. Number five, Loki. Now, yes, look, I get it. Loki is a controversial figure. On occasion, he has gone totally nuts. In terms of how he approached wrestling, though, man, he opened a door. Because while Japanese-style wrestling wasn't totally alien to the West, Loki decided, well, I am basically going to do exactly what they did. And when people saw him on the American indie scene, they were like, hot damn, this guy's on fire. And then he lent on strikes and death blows to really get over with the audience. And yes, he did have a tendency to sometimes do these for real. And that's stupid. When it was working in the way it was meant to, though, not only was he beating people up, but he was getting beaten up too. So you could actually sit there and go, well, you know, I know the rest of this stuff is fake, but this one, well, I think it's on the money. Even when Osprey has said that he used to sit down and study Loki's work, especially when he was having matches with the Amazing Red, that's another guy that we should throw in there. And if you want to have your brain blown today, go and watch the contest they had. You could even say that when Will Ospreay and Ricochet faced off all those years later that did set the internet on fire, that they were basically replicating what they had already seen, but updating it a little bit. And that's why you have to talk about the influence. So yes, it is a shame that Loki sometimes would go into business for himself. But once again, if we just remove that from the equation, kind of was ahead of the game. Number four, Randy Savage. If Randy Savage hadn't done his thing in the 1980s, maybe some of the wrestling landscape we get in 2024 wouldn't have existed. The man doesn't get enough flowers. I mean, do not forget, he was so over in 1988, he was able to rival the popularity of Hulk Hogan. That doesn't just happen. It was also Savage who one day decided to throw Ricky Morton through a table to get the ultimate reaction. And do I even need to keep going on here? I was watching a match yesterday, and even when the table was revealed, the entire audience went, yes. Let's also not forget that it was Randy right in the middle of an NWA Memphis invasion angle, and wrestling still loves those. And he was also a huge advocate for planning his matches beforehand. That's just the way today. That's what we all do. Of course, his match against Ricky Steamboat 2 at WrestleMania 3 is still a huge inspiration for so many wrestlers. So look at all the damn tick boxes we have just gone through. The Macho Man is an all-time legend. Number three, Jerry Lawler. Going through Jerry Lawler's entire career these days is a little bit difficult. So some stories will have you scratching your head. If we do just focus on his in-ring movements, though, of course you have to talk about Memphis wrestling, where he was the king for like 72 million years. But actually today, I want to bring ECW back into this because the King really did have a pretty damn good idea. Because he essentially invaded ECW as the proper outsider and would walk around going, man, this extreme championship wrestling, it's absolutely crap. It's filled with low lives. Flub me, did he get some heat? Now we do once again jump forward to 2024. Do you know who else did this really well recently? It was Matt Cardona when he left WWE and he joined the Indies. He was telling people, yeah, I'm king of this place. And at first people were so damn mad. He smashed it. I mean, you can even bring the idea of the Jericho Appreciation Society into this conversation because they were meant to be sports entertainers in a wrestling world. You've got to imagine a lot of it came from what Jerry did. The King was also on hand when the WWF had a mini feud with Memphis in 1993. So we're crossing those streams again. He also may very well have the best working punch ever. Everybody should be influenced by that. Number two, Ricky Morton. So you may have seen a TikTok meme recently that was some kind of gerbil or hamster that was crawling along the floor in pain. And the caption was, every single professional wrestler when they're trying to make the tag. And that was totally true. You can't deny that one. And of course, nearly every single tag team match on the planet these days will have a, oh my gosh, I can't make the slap before they do get it. And do you know who was doing that back in the day to popularize it? I mean, it's Ricky Morton. You should have figured that out. That's really how the Rock and Roll Express got so over as well, because their selling was so damn good, especially Ricky. Like, if you go and watch one of his matches right now, you'd be like, ah, wait a second. I think he's actually in pain. He's not. I am so confident that you will see this one the next time you watch a wrestling show. I'm going to put my hair on it. So as long as that does happen and you do observe it, Make sure you give some praise to Ricky Morton, who started it all. Number one, Roman Reigns. Now, this is a little bit unfair and mostly done to get a reaction. 
But let's just get into it. But the big dog version of Roman Reigns was very much a window into what WWE was doing most of the mid 2000s, which was ignoring the audience because they had a plan, damn it, and they weren't gonna deviate. Now we all know the story as well because upper management had decided by hook or by crook, they weren't gonna falter. And that meant when Roman came to the ring, he was getting booed, even though they wanted him to get cheered. But really the boos weren't aimed at him and they were aimed at the powers that be. What? I do want to point out that the Tribal Chief version of Reigns is an absolute bona fide superstar and all time, but the previous reaction we talked about pissed so many people off, in many ways you could argue it helped to create AEW. Now that may sound a little bit over the top, which I do understand, but the dissatisfaction got to such a level, there were so many people desperate for an alternative, and given the likes of Cody Rhodes and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega were free agents, and that Tony Khan could get Chris Jericho, he was like, well, I've got the superstars, and I kind of think this is the right place and the right time, and you can't say he was wrong. Here we are five years later, and they're still going strong. Mostly though, this absolutely worked out in the long term, because if you're a normal wrestling fan, having competition has been the best thing ever. I know now you want to go nuts in the comments. That's fine, engagement is great. I will say that I think it's healthier now than it has been over the past two decades, and that's saying something. But maybe there's actually more to that Roman Reigns mistake we've been talking about. Now, of course, you must disagree with me. And again, you can do that in the comments below and make sure you click the video on the screen, which is me ranting and raving about a recent wrestling show. Why wouldn't you want that? Like the video, share the video and subscribe. Otherwise, have a terrific 24 hours, my friend, or 48 hours or 72, whatever the hell you want. See you soon.